YouTube House Audio presents Warhammer 40k The Legacy of Russ A Space Wolves Anthology The Lost King Book 1 Written by Robbie McNiven and narrated by Warwyvern The World Wolf Slayer Svelgard Logan Grimnar the Fang Father, the Old Wolf, the High King of Fenris, was dead. So the demons said. They howled and shrieked and gibbered the news from warp spawned throats that shouldn't have been capable of intelligible words. But the servants of the Dark Gods had never concerned themselves with nature's constraints. Logan Grimnar is dead. They lie, Sven growled. The young wolf lord was clutching his double-headed battle axe, Frostclaw, with such intensity that his whole armored body was shaking. They lie. They are the warp scum, Olaf Blackstone said, lying is the sole reason for their existence. The white-pelted bloodguard stood behind and slightly to the right of his lord, yellow eyes surveying the bleak hills that lay barely a mile across the icy sea. Those hills now undulated with a living carpet of demons, like an infestation of lice swarming over a rotting skull. They had appeared not half an hour before, crawling like primordial nightmares from the depths of Svelgard's oceans. They were massing for an attack. Cohorts of lesser demons marshalling beneath the nightmarish banners of their gods, and as they did so, their deranged shrieks carried across the cold waters to Sven and the rest of his fire howler space wolves. They're trying to provoke us, Olaf said, hoping we divide our forces. Sven Bloodhowl opened his mouth to reply, then paused as the hammering of bolt of fire broke out behind him. His great company was still purging the last of the defenses at the heart of the World Wolf's lair burning the shrieking demons from their holds with gouts of blazing Prometheum before mowing them down with mass reactive rounds. Progress reports trickled back constantly over the Vox, as the noose tightened around the last words spawn, left in the depths of the fortified missile control nexus. Nine packs, the entirety of Sven's great company, were stalking the bunkers, Redoubts and weapon emplacements arrayed in concentric circles around the Rockcrete Keep dominating the island's center. They would not stop until they had hunted down every last creature from the first demonic wave to have overrun the island. I'm provoked, Sven said as the polter echoes were snatched away by Svelgard's cruel wind. What's the status of the Drakebanes? Ten of the pups still able to wield a chainsword. And the Firestone? Only five. Worgid is among the dead. The survivors are still hungry, though, as are our wolfen. Then you shall lead them, Olaf. Vox Torvind, Krega, Untir, and Istun. Have them return to the central bunkers and assemble here, and two Thunderhawks. Godspear and Wolf Dawn have both refueled and rearmed. They are inbound from the fleet, expected arrival in ten minutes. Then they shall be the vehicles of our wrath. A wolf should never suffer a liar. In truth, Sven had not killed enough today. His heart still raced and his fingers itched. The thought of weirdling filth defiling not just Svelgard, but all the worlds of his home system, brought up an instinctive urge to lash out. He had not had word from any of the other battle zones for hours. As far as he was aware, Harold Deathwolf was still consolidating on nearby Frostheim while Eagle Ironwolf and the Great Wolf were engaged on Midgardia. The demonic taunts reached him again from across the narrow sea, and he shuddered. They were wrong. Logan Grimnar was not dead. He couldn't be. To attack is unwise, my yar, Olaf said, still watching the nearby island. There are doubtless more such filth spawning from the rifts below the waves all about us. If we split our forces, we invite annihilation. Sven turned to face his old packmate, and although rage still burned in the wolf lord's grey eyes, 
His tattooed features and strong stubble-lined jaw were clenched with a tight smile. Are your fangs getting too long for all this, Olaf? he asked. The blood guard's champion returned his gaze, levelly, without expression, too old to be so easily drawn. Don't tell me a hundred odd kills are enough to sate you for one day, Sven pressed. If the bloodguard are done with me, I'm sure the Oathbound would take your place, or the fireworms. Olaf still said nothing, but there was a chill whisper of naked steel as his wolf claws slid free from his gauntlets. If you wish to teach monsters not to lie, the bloodguard said, then I will be as happy as ever to assist with the lesson. Seven miles south of the magma gates, Midgardia. Logan Grimnar is dead, the demon choked on the words, a flood of writhing maggots spilling from its locked jaw. Eagle Ironwolf slammed his boot down on the fallen plague-bearer's skull, smashing it to a grey, squirming pulp. Strike force Mordecai, come in. The Ironwolf snapped into the vox. His only answer was static discord. It had been the same for over an hour now. He fought back the urge to stamp down again on the plague-bearer as it sank back into the ooze that had once been the jungle floor. Mayar, we must return to the Iron Fist. Mayar, we must return to the Iron Fist. The voice of Conrad Wolfhide, the pack leader of his Iron Guard, cut in over the link. We can't stay here. This entire place is toxic. It will eat us alive. Eagle knew Conran was right, but still he hesitated. The purple spore jungles of Midgardia had been transformed beyond all recognition by Nurgle's rotting touch. Once mighty trunks, now swollen with blight and infested by gigantic maggots, their leaves turned black with decay. The ground underfoot had been reduced to a fetid, cloying pus bog that writhed with worms and sightless snapping maws. Eagle's great company had been battling through the corruption for hours, part of the two-pronged counter-attack designed to sweep the weirdlings off Midgardia and retake its subterranean cities. The offensive, however, was becoming bogged down in every sense of the word. Even worse, the runic Yuvik script that flashed across Eagle's visor warned him that the poisonous fog clouding the air was rapidly stripping away layer after layer of his power armor. Even reinforced Ceramite, sealed by the Iron Priests and blessed by the Wolf Priests, was no match for Midgardia's acidic air. The rest of Eagle's great company was faring no better. Howls of agony occasionally interrupted the Vox chatter as the nightmarish atmosphere penetrated an unfortunate warrior's armored joints, or ate through his visor's lenses causing flesh to blister and slow away in just a few heartbeats. Eagle had ordered all packs to withdraw to the sealed interiors of their transports while he continued to try to make contact with Strikeforce Morkai, with the great wolf Logan Grimnar. Back to Iron Fist, Eagle finally said. Around him, heavy bolters and las cannons hammered and cracked as the armored might of the Iron Wolves sought to keep the shuffling, slime-soaked Nurgle talibans at bay. For the past hour, the droning weird spawn had shown little desire to close with the spearhead of Eagle's stalled advance, apparently content to soak up their firepower among the blistered trees and let the spores of the invested jungle do their work for them. Eagle had been forced to halt his grinding offensive when the Vox had lost all contact with Grimnar's own thrust, which was supposed to have been keeping pace below, following Midgardia's labyrinth of underground tunnels and passageways. Communications had been intermittent right from the beginning, but now it was gone entirely, and the counter-offensive wasn't even a day old. Eagle was the last member of the great company to return to his transport, slamming the ceiling rune on the hatch behind him. Within Iron Fist's red-lit hold, Conran and the five other members of his pack waited, their grey battle plates befouled with a thick layer of pestilential filth. They were all that remained of Eagle's Iron Guard, 
His Terminators had been lent to Grimnar when he had descended into Midgardia's depths with the champions of Fenris. He felt their loss almost as acutely as he did that of the Great Wolf himself. He activated the cogitator monitor bolted above the hold's crew hatch, uploading the latest combat schematics to its gently pulsing screen display. His great company had been divided into four spears of Russ, one for each point on the map. Fists of Predator and Vindicator battle tanks supported rhinos, razorbacks, and land raiders filled with the footpacks. They'd punched out from their base at the magma gates and swept all before them. Now, they were stalled and separated, the blinking runes representing each spear static and beset by assaulting icons. The Midgardian defense forces acting as their reserves were suffering even worse. Their fragile human physiologies, no match for the deadliest of the plague gods' diseases. Eagle watched their casualty percentages for a moment, seeing them tick up steadily with each passing second. Even the most basic military mind would have acknowledged that their position had become an impossible one. The Iron Wolf activated his vox, a blink clicking to add the Iron Wolf pack leaders from all four spears to the channel. This is Eagle, he said. Without word from Strikeforce Morkai, the gains we have made over the past two hours are no longer tenable. We must assume it is possible for Weirdspawn to infiltrate our interior lines through the unguarded tunnels below us. If they successfully break our Midgardian Defense Force reserves, then each spear of Rus will be cut off from the Magma Gate's landing zones, as well as each other. I am therefore ordering Strikeforce Fenris to withdraw by packs towards the Magma Gates. Once there, we will commence a staggered withdrawal into orbit, starting with the defense forces and ending with my own spear. Pack leaders, acknowledge. As confirmations trickled back down the link, Eagle had to fight to stay silent. His cold, calculated orders, so characteristic of the Iron Wolf, concealed the war which raged in his armor-plated breast. Logically, a staged withdrawal was the only option. Strikeforce Fenris had stalled deep inside an utterly inimical environment, was on the brink of overstretching even as it was outflanked, and the enemy's numbers showed no sign of decreasing. To continue to advance ran the risk of seeing his entire great company overrun and annihilated, their remains eaten up by Midgardia's hideous plague jungles. But the old wolf was missing somewhere below. If Eagle took a backward step now, he knew he would be forever remembered as the one who had abandoned Logan Grimnar. If he saved his iron walls by ordering a retreat, he damned himself forever in the eyes of his brothers. He snarled with frustration and keyed to the Vox again. An addendum to the previous orders. Conran Wolfhide of my own pack will be assuming command of the strike force with immediate effect until my return. Conran's head snapped up, and he began to protest. Eagle carried on, speaking over him. I will be taking the remainder of my iron guard on the ground to re-establish contact with the Great Wolf. The evacuation from the magma gates is to proceed as previously outlined. Within that framework, all pack leaders are to defer to Conran as though he speaks with my own voice. Is that clear? More affirmations, and now complaints too. Let the cold claws come with you, Lord, Yatarn Stone Eye said over the box. My pack have been firing blind into spore cloud and wading through demon spore all day. Let us continue the iron hunt, Lord, I beg you. Is what the weirlings are chanting true? Noctir Ice Claw of the Snowfangs asked before Eagle could respond. Is the Great Wolf dead? That is what I'm going to disprove, Eagle said. And the rest of you will follow my orders, or Russ help me, I will tear the fangs from the jaws of each and every pack leader in this great company. Show some discipline, Iron Wolves. Lord, Conran began. He stood and was facing the Iron Wolf, bowed slightly in the hold's confined space. Eagle raised a gauntlet before he could go any further. 
I know what you are going to say, Condoran. There are no other options. I cannot let us all die here, and Midgardia's depths are no place for an armored column, but nor can I abandon the great wolf. You will take the iron wolves to the magma gates, and I will see you all again on the bridge of the wolf tide. For a moment it seemed as though Conran would argue, but instead he just shook his head, his jaw locked and gauntlets clenched. The nearest recorded entrance to the Midgarian underworld is 300 yards southwest of this position, Eagle said, activating a map uplink on his visor's display. Directly towards the nearest Taliban. It's an old mine chute designated Beta 117. The Iron Fist will take us that far, and then you will assume command and get my wolves clear of this hellhole. Understood? Conran nodded, saying nothing no longer looking at the Iron Wolf. Eagle knew better than to push his obedience any further. He linked to the Land Raider Crusader's internal vox. Torvald, Ologon's live. For Russ and the All Father, take us forward. Morkai's keep. Frostheim. Canis Wolfborn crouched, ignoring the ache in his joints. The day's bloodletting had been long and fierce. His armor bore the scars of demon blades and bolter rounds alike, and the foul eye core splattering its surface had only just begun to crust. The champion of Harold Deathwolf reached out and grasped the corpse before him by the pauldron, rolling it onto its back. The body was that of Snorri Redtooth, one of the grey hunters belonging to Eren Frostwolf's pack. Canlis only knew as much before he recognized Snorri's musk. The Grey Hunter's head was missing. Nor had his pack kin been any more fortunate. Canis had been tracking their corpses deep into the vaults of Morkai's keep for almost an hour. The only one he'd yet to find was Eren himself. The bodies of the Grey Hunters were certainly not alone down in the keep's depths. Through betrayal and vile maleficarum, the forces of chaos had seized the Space Wolves' fortress, presaging the beginning of the demonic incursions across the system. In the furious battle to recapture the strongholds from the treacherous Alpha Legion, fighting had spilled down into its lowest levels. Canis had counted half a dozen Space Wolves' bodies, mostly blood claws whose names he'd forgotten though he recalled their sense. They were outnumbered by the rag-clad cultists that carpeted the vaulted halls and corridors. All around the mark of furious retribution was clear, in the bloody hacking and tearing of chain blades, and the vicious, gory detonation of close-range bolt fire. There were even three Alpha Legionnaires, the stale stench of ancient corruption coming off their bodies turning Canis's stomachs. But all of them had fallen at least two hours previously. Snorri and the rest of the dead grey hunters were fresh. Canis carried on down the corridor, noting the location of Snorri's body on his Vambrace marker. Behind him, Fangir, his loyal Thunderwolf, padded silently. Canis could sense the huge animal's tiredness mirroring his own by its slow, heavy panting. The beast's wiry fur was matted with blood, and not all of it belonged to the enemy. But there was no time to stop. Not yet. Like the Thunderwolf, Canis had caught a scent. There was something still down there, something that shouldn't be. At the end of the corridor, open blast doors marked the entrance to the keep's main armory. On its threshold, Canis found Eren. The pack leader's cuirass had been split by a blow of incredible force, and his breastbone carved open, exposing the bloody mess of the wolf's inner organs. Inside the armory, more cultists lay butchered, but none of them could possibly have dealt such a wound. Two other doors branched off from the entrance, one to the left and one to the right, Canis closed his eyes and inhaled, opening his senses. There was still something lurking beneath the acrid stench of weapon discharges. 
the reek of stale sweat, the tang of blood and the pack musks of his fellow wolves, something at once sickly sweet and bitter, wholly unnatural. He had caught it at the entrance to the vaults, as the rest of Harold's great company had begun the process of collecting their dead and incinerating heretic corpses. He had slipped away from the grim work, his instincts bristling. The fight was not yet over. The smell was coming from the right-hand door. It was the entrance to a munitions shaft, the floor sloping downwards into darkness. The lumen strips overhead had failed. Canis began to descend, trusting to his sense of smell. Even for a space wolf it was keen. Canis was a natural-born predator, the only member of the Death Wolves able to match their lord, Harold, in the Great Hunt. Shadows were nothing to him. There were no more bodies. It seemed as though the fighting had passed this section of the vaults by, though that didn't explain why the blast door had been lying open. The unnatural smell grew stronger, a weirdling stench that caused the space wolf's hackles to rise. Ahead, he sensed rather than saw the shaft coming to an end, widening out into what he assumed was a munitions bunker. Behind, Fanger began to growl, the throaty noise reverberating through the narrow space. Canis slid his wolf claws free. There was a noise from ahead, his torn senses making it sound hellishly loud. The skitter of claws on Rockcrete. The stench grew even worse. Weirdlings, he snarled softly to Fanger. His suspicions had to be right. Harold needed to be warned. He keyed his vox. That was when the first demon launched itself, screeching from the darkness. Long howl. Valdermani. For the first time in a long time, Krom Dragon Gaze found himself on his knees. It was not an injury that had driven him down, though blood still trickled from the rapidly clotting wound in his shoulder. The demon prince's blade had bitten deep, but the wolf lord had suffered worse. No, it was the realization of just how close they had all come to annihilation. Even before he had joined the ranks of the Sky Warriors, death had held no fear for Krom. But there were worse things in the galaxy than death. As the demonic invasions had spilled out across the system, Longhowl, the primary astropathic beacon of the wolf moon of Valdemani, had come under attack. The fact that the chaos-tainted glyph planted in Longhowl's Corestorium would probably have obliterated Krom had he never figured in his thinking as he led the assault to destroy it. What had driven him to his knees was the knowledge that, if he had failed, the sigil's infernal weirdling power would have lanced a false image of his space wall of slaughtering imperial subjects into the mind of every psyker in the segmentum. The illusion would have cemented the belief that the sons of Rus had turned traitor and set the Imperium's might against the whole of Krom's chapter. The thought made his flesh crawl with disgust. A silver gauntlet, blackened by fire, appeared before the wolf lord. He clasped it and allowed himself to be hauled up by its strong grip. Well met, dragon gaze, said Captain Stern. The Grey Knight had removed his helmet his noble features streaked with sweat. His armor was still smoking from the hellish, weird fire which had engulfed it, the marks of warding and protection inscribed into the silver agus plate, glowing bright. It is over? Crom asked as he looked around. Moments before, the Corestorium had been packed with howling demons, and the wailing melted remains of the station's possessed astropaths. Now it was a scorched ichor splattered wreck. The astropaths reduced to skeletal husks in their burned-out cradles. The chaos glyph that had been the epicenter of the wolf ritual was split and broken. The chaos glyph that had been the epicenter of the wolf ritual was split and broken. The multi-hued light that had blazed from it now doused. Crom remembering Stern forced his way through the icon's weird flame 
and plunging his crackling force sword into its heart, shattering it. The moments that followed were a blur. Blinding light, shrieks of frustration and terror, a splitting pain that still throbbed dully behind Crom's eyes. But the demons were gone. They had won. It is over, said Stern. Around the edges of the perched Corostorium, Grey Knights and Space Wolves alike were picking themselves up. Not all who had fallen rose again. We must establish contact with Fenris, Crom said. Send word that the demons have been thwarted and that we are both still alive. That should give those who doubt us reason enough to reconsider. Stern nodded. The ritual was supposed to have set the wolves and the knights against one another. But even with the demonic plot defeated, there was no telling how the Imperium was responding to the events in the Fenris system. Massive warp incursions, mutation among the Adeptus Astartes, rumors of treachery. Something had set out to destroy the Space Wolves, and it had come diabolically close to succeeding. I must return to the Fang, Crom continued. I cannot leave it unguarded a moment longer. Then go with my thanks. Your assistance here was invaluable, Stone said. If I had not left Fenris to come to our aid, I could never have stopped the ritual in time. Bjorn the fell-handed saw you trapped and killed, Crom said. I would not have left the fang on any word save his. A vox blurt interrupted Stern before he could respond. The signal's ident code belonged to Crom's flagship, the Winterbite. My lord, we are receiving a priority message from the Fang, said the voice of one of the ship's host cars. Patch me through, Crum ordered, turning away from Stern. After a moment static, the voice of Albjorn Vogel, chief Vox Hoskard of those Fang's communications array, spoke to him over the link. My lord, our long-range Argor sweeps have detected a large fleet translating in system. The signifier a call to Rod Imperial. Thus far, we've identified strike cruisers and battle barges belonging to the Ultramarines, Iron Hands, Marines Malevolent, Doom Griffins, and Shadow Hunters, along with the capital ships of the Imperial's Navy, 32nd Obscure Subfleet, night carriers from House Morton, and six Astra Militarum mass transporters. We also believe. Vogel trailed off. Go on. Crom said. My lord, one of the signifiers belongs to the fortress monastery of the Dark Angels. We believe the rock arrived in Fenrisi in the real space approximately twenty minutes ago. Hail them, Crom said. We've tried, lord. They've refused to even acknowledge the signal collection. Our ships around Midgardia, Svergard, and Frostheim are also reporting no contact. Crom broke the connection for a moment to look at Stern. A crusade fleet has just entered the system, he growled, led by the Dark Angels. It's as I feared, Stern said. Supreme Grand Master Azrael has been shadowing your chapter since he learned of your genetic anomaly on Nereides. I suspect he believes the wolves to be tainted. Fogel, Chrome snapped into the vox. Yes, Lord. Raise all shields and prime defensive batteries. Advise all our fleet assets throughout the system to do likewise. I am returning to Fang immediately. Yes, Lord. Are we on war footing? Not unless they fire first. You need to take me to the rock, Stone said. If they won't open their vox nets to any communications from us, I must speak with Azrael directly. Your battle barge is ashes, Stone, Crom said. If you wish to leave this moon, you are welcome aboard the Winterbite but I am going direct to the Fang. I have already sullied my oath by abandoning it to come here. I will not compound my dishonor further by leaving the hearth world to the mercy of fools and zealots. As you wish, Stern said. But once there, I must request the use of one of your ships. And you shall have it, Crom said. It would be well if you reached Azrael before he reaches me because all father protect him if he launches a single strike against any part of this system. The rock, in high orbit above Midgaria. The primary command bridge of the rock was a cavernous place, 
full of faded glory and shadows that had lain undisturbed for ten millennia. At its heart a great tiered day rose, each stone step carved with intricate figures telling the long history of the First Legion. The top of the ziggurat bore a throne of brass and steel, bristling with data ports and hollow screens, vox uplinks and rune banks. There sat Azrael, keeper of the truth, supreme grand master of the dark angels, and all of the unforgiven. Face set beneath his white cowl, he surveyed the bridge below without expression. Serfs, servitors, and data slaves scurried to and fro amidst tiered ranks of cogitator banks and oculus viewscreens, while menials toiled in the communication pits sunk around the day, backs bent double, blind to the cold stone columns that rose around them to the distant vaulted ceiling. The air was thick with darting servo skulls and fluttering auto cherubim, their senses filling the air with the cloying smell of warp bane and other sacred unguents. The rattle and chime of cogitators, the crackle of vox horns and the throaty machine cant of the bridge's choir of coarse chartists echoed back endlessly from the stained crystal flecks of the viewing ports opposite Azrael. The bridge in all its cold stone majesty dwarfed even the greatest ships of most other space marine chapters. Azrael noted a few of his fellow Adeptus Astartes casting glances up at the highest reaches of the ceiling. Swathed in darkness far above, they were assembled around a large circular hollow chart near the central nave, laid out before Azrael's day. The chart itself was beaming a grainy green representation of the Fenris system into the smoky air, the orbs representing Midgardia, Fenris, Frostheim, and their attendant moons revolving slowly around the pallid sphere that was the system's sun, the wolf's eye. As the briefing began, the display flickered, overlaid by red and blue sigils and arrows that plotted the arrival of the Crusade fleet. It was an impressive undertaking, Azrael thought, a stark reminder of the danger that developing events posed to the Imperium. Normally a Crusade fleet took far longer to bring together, never mind fully deploy. Azrael recalls the Antarica Crusade which he had participated in when he had still been a battle brother in Sergeant Nephilim's tactical squad. It had first been approved by the High Lords of Terror two centuries before Azrael had ever been born. It took two hundred years to assemble the full fleet assets, petition the Adeptus Mechanicus and the knightly households for support, and divert Space Marine chapters from operations elsewhere. The Crusade's nominal leaders had died and been replaced three times over, and entire army groups of the Asha Militarum had been disbanded and recruited afresh before the vanguard of the battle fleet had even left its docks. The force Azrael had brought together was smaller than that of Antarica, but it was still fearsome. Contingents from fourteen chapters, two Imperial navies, sub battle fleets, and three Asha Militarum army groups. Further forces had sworn to assist and were en route, including titans of the Legio Dominatus. Only a figure of Azrael's considerable standing and experience had been summoned such strength with so little notice. Below him, that strength was exemplified by the fourteen space marines attending the final operational overview. Among their heraldry, Azrael could see howling griffins and red consoles, the vicious yellows of the marines malevolent, the grey battleplate of shadow hunters, and the silver of one of his chapter's own successors, the guardians of the covenant. Besides those physically present, two of the Adeptus Astartes were represented by throbbing blue hololithic displays, Captain Apathis of the Ultramarine Sixth Company, and Iron Captain Terek of the Iron Hands clan, Company Harmek. They were both already bound for the world of Frostheim, on the far edge of the system, leading a detachment of the Crusade's fleet's might. Interrogator Chaplain Elazar led the briefing. Azrael had given him the task on the advice of Asmodai. 
The master interrogator chaplain had been impressed by his apprentice as of late, and Azrael knew how difficult it was to earn the favor of the grim master of repentance. Even now he towered like a silent revenant beside Azrael's throne, observing Eleazar without comment. Midgardia, Eleazar was saying, a gesture highlighting the sphere spinward of the wolf's eye. The second largest of the Fenris system's three planets and the world we are currently entering high orbit above, its surface was merely a toxic jungle classed as a death world. The Megarian natives lived below the outer crust in cavernous subterranean hive cities. The past tense is noted, Brother Chaplin, Terek the Iron Hand said, his voice crackling from the vox horn built into the hollow display projecting him. What fate has befallen them? Long-range auger scans indicate the surface of Midgaria has suffered a near-total demonic infestation. Of the situation underground, we have no idea. Haven't the wolves tried to purge it? Captain Perthus of the Ultramarines asked, his own hollow form flickering. With two great companies, including that of Logan Grimnar himself. And what has become of them? Of Grimnar? We are still collecting information from intercepted Vox transmissions and high-yield service scans, but it seems their counter-attack was a complete failure. The great company known as the Iron Wolves are currently evacuating the planet, while the fate of Grimnar and the champions of Fenris remains unknown. They were last recorded battling the infestation in the caverns below the planet's surface. A murmur passed through the space marines. Elazar pressed on. Valdemani, the wolf moon, Fenris's only satellite, he said, indicating the orb slowly circling the white and blue sphere of the Space Wolves' homeworld. Intelligence reports that a battle barge of the Grey Knight's Third Brotherhood was destroyed in orbit by a Nova cannon, sighted near the astropathic beacon known as Longhowl. Whether that was due to the demonic incursion, or represents treachery by the Space Wolves, is currently unknown as is Captain Stern's status. Picked footage remotely extracted from Long Howl's databank shows vessels leaving the battle barge for the moon's domeplex before it was destroyed. If demonic forces have indeed overrun Valdmani, it may well be that they are attempting to implicate the wolves in whatever has befallen Stern. They need hardly try, Captain Vor of the Marine's malevolent spat. If the stories of the wolves, mutants are to be believed, that is an accusation that will be further investigated as soon as time allows, Azrael said. The muttering among the assembled space marines died as he spoke, his deep voice carrying easily across the hectic bridge. Right now, securing the Fenris system against demonic incursion is our foremost priority. Once it has been purged, we shall hold the wolves to account for what they have tried to hide from us, from the Imperium. The Dark Angel's cold words left a gulf of silence in their wake. After a moment, Elazar continued. Frostheim, the third and final planet of the Fenris system, it is the site of Morkai's keep, which was recently seized by heretic forces before being retaken. It seems by Harold Deathwolf's great company. What heretic forces? Terek demanded. We are still gathering intelligence on the matter. Frostheim is orbited by a natural satellite called Svelgard. The moon's surface is dotted with a number of small islands, sites for a powerful orbital defense battery known as the Claws of the Worldwolf. These were recently recaptured from a demonic infestation, which appears to be originating from beneath Svelgard seas. Are the weapon systems still operational? asked Bohemund, captain of the Doom Griffin's fourth company. As far as we are aware, yes. Brother Captain Zepathus and Terek are both en route there with their brethren as we speak. Supported by the Imperial Navy's 483rd Obscurus Battle Fleet Sub-Detachment and an Astromilitarum Army Group. They will stabilize the situation. Both Epathus and Terek's hollow forms nodded their confirmation, the motion causing them to flicker. And if the wolves do not wish to be stabilized? Vor asked. Then they shall be taught a long overdue lesson in how to cooperate with their brethren, Elazar replied. Unnoticed, a smile ghosted across Azrael's lips. 
he could see why Asmodai favored the young interrogator chaplain. Besides their presence on the system's three planets and two moons, Sector Defense data files show that the wolves maintain two Remelis classed off forts. Elazar continued. Designated Gurmanyal and Mjalnar. Contact was lost with both soon after the incursion began. The rest of his words were drowned out by the voice of Azrael's Vox Seneschal, Mendaxis, speaking in the Supreme Grand Master's ear. Sire, we have just detected a ship signature not registered with the fleet breaking into real space coreward of our position. Initial scan showed was last registered as a private vessel associated with the retinue of Lord Inquisitor Banis de Mornay. Azrael's expression remained stoic, but his grip tightened fractionally on the skulls carved into his throne's flanks. Beside him, Asmodai, listening to the Vox exchange, turned sharply to look at Azrael. De Mornay, the Supreme Grandmaster thought. So the old fool yet lived. Of course he'd followed them here. He's hailing us, Mendaxis said. Accept it, Azrael replied. Throne vid only. A small screen, framed by the wings of the Aquila, rose from the throne's arm. For a second, the monitor fizzed green with static before resolving itself into a face Azrael had hoped never to see again. When he had first met Lord Inquisitor de Mornay, the man had been a paragon of imperial strength. Young, iron-jawed, steel-eyed, his red hair cropped close, more accustomed to flak plate than the robes of his ordo. But a century had taken its toll, rejuvenance processes or not. Now the face that occupied the screen was sagging into fat, the jawline more jowl-line, one eye roomy with cataracts. Supreme Grand Master Azrael, said de Mornay, his deep voice crackling to the vox horn set below the screen. He was smiling. I am glad to see you again. I cannot say the same, Azrael replied. He didn't have time for the Inquisition's games, especially not the ones that de Mornay loved to play. Am I interrupting something? The Crusade fleet is currently preparing to firebomb the surface of Midgardia. May I ask why, aside from the fact that Midgardia falls under the control of the Vicar Fenrica, I'm sure your Primarch would be proud if I recall my progenium history lessons correctly. The planet has fallen to a demonic incursion. How do you know? Auger sweeps, Vox intercepts strategic analysis data, the visions of my librarians, and the fact that a Space Wolf's great company is currently fleeing the surface. The champions of Fenris? No, we believe it to be the Iron Wolves. But the champions are also on Midgardia, aren't they? Led by Logan Grimnard himself. Our Vox transcripts report all contact with him has been lost. De Mornay was silent for a moment before speaking again. I would like to request an immediate audience. Your rosette will do you little good, De Mornay, Azrael warned. I'm not some cowering militarum general or docile planetary governor. If you wish to speak, it'll be on my terms, not yours. I see the sons of the lion are as cooperative with his holy orders as ever. De Mornay replied, acid creeping into his voice. I will humor you this one time, De Mornay, as a token of good will towards the Inquisition. But don't expect anything more from me. A few chapter masters would grant you the privileges I do. Expect me within the hour. Azrael cut the link without another word. He knew de Mornay well enough to understand that rebuffing him would only heighten his determination. Better to lure the fool into the lion's den and show him the consequences of his beliefs firsthand. Below him, Elazar was describing the intention of the chapter to firebomb Midgardia's surface. The muttering of the assembled commanders showed it was as unpopular among them as it had been with de Mornay. Azrael keyed his personal vox. Dismiss them he ordered Elazar. Without showing any sign of having heard Azrael over the link, Elazar began to bring the briefing to a close.
Demone is here because of us, not the wolves, Asmodai said, his voice hissing quietly from the moor of his grim black skull helm. Without a doubt, we must keep him at arm's length. Have no fear, brother, I intend to. Below the day, the thirteen space marine commanders were departing, each one bowing briefly towards Azrael before they left. Himaeus of the Knights of the Covenant was the last to exit the bridge, exchanging a curt nod with the Supreme Grand Master before passing through the blast doors. Azrael rose and descended from the day, Asmodai following him like a shadow woven from nightmares. Brother Eleazar, Azrael said, how do you find our brethren's appraisal of the coming operation? Approving for the most part, the interrogator chaplain said, stepping away from the hollow chart and bowing as Azrael joined him. Though our decision to bomb Midgaria met with ill feeling, it does not sit well with them to burn the planet with the Great Wolf still unaccounted for. Of course, it is not what I would wish to do, but we have no alternatives. Midgardia's surface is now so infested that only warp spawn could possibly exist down there for any length of time. The entire strength of this crusade would be liquidated if we sought to make planetfall, and we cannot let the warp rifts on the surface grow any further. It must burn, all of it. Yes, my lord, Adazar said. They will all accept our decision, I have no doubt. Sire, Mendaxis interrupted him. Lord Inquisitor de Mornay Shuttle is requesting docking clearance. Grant it, Azrael said tersely, and said Brother Sergeant Elijah to escort him personally. Tell him there are to be no deviations, they are to come straight here. Yes, sire. Azrael glanced at Asmodai. A necessary evil, brother, he said. The master interrogator chaplain didn't reply. Sergeant Elijah brought Lord Inquisitor Bannister Mornay to the bridge borne aloft on a cushioned vital support palanquin which was welded to the backs of two tracked servitor units. Behind him came a train of disparate creatures. There was a lithe-looking black armored sister of battle, her eyes staring with fiery intensity from her flame-scarred face. Alongside her was a limping, blue-robed Lex Mechanic, borne down by a great stack of data slates and scrolls, tugging on his robe tails a long-limbed Jacero, taking in the grim splendor of the rock's bridge with simian fascination. A dead-eyed cherubim wove and darted overhead on buzzing rotary wings, trailing more parchments. Behind them all shuffled an emaciated figure, naked bar a soiled loincloth, its wiry body stitched with scars and stim injection ports. Rather than hands, its arms ended in crudely grafted electro flails, currently trailing inert along the floor. Its head was covered by a red hood and bound by a riveted visor stylized into the shape of the inquisitorial eye. The faint sound of soothing plain song drifted from its lobe implants. Azrael grimaced in disgust as he watched the Aklo flagellant limping after its owner. Greeting, Supreme Grand Master, De Mornay called as his palanquin crossed the bridge, rumbling awkwardly around ranked cogitator pews. As he spoke, the Lex Mechanic started to scramble for a free slate and autoquill. You would bring an abomination like that aboard the rock? Azrael demanded. I still on the Arco flagellant. We all do the Emperor's will, de Mornay's responded, and I've made poor VX-918 here enact that will in many terrible ways down the years. It's good for him to get out. Emperor's will, muttered the Lex Mechanic, also Quill now scratching furiously across a data slate. Your appearance is as sudden as ever. Azrael said dispassionately, and unwelcome. Why are you here, de Mornay? The arrival of anyone bearing a rosette ought to be sudden, Supreme Grand Master. The Inquisitor replied, palanquin rocking to a halt before the Dark Angels. He shifted his aging body fractionally, the wires binding him to his moving recliner's life support systems rattling. 
and only unwelcome if you have something to hide. Except for the sister of battle, his retinue clustered behind him like a herd of frightened grox calves. Something to hide, the lex mechanic repeated, still writing. Though he remained silent, Azrael could feel Asmodai's anger emanating like the chill of the void beside him. That doesn't answer my question. Ah, but I believe it is my prerogative to ask the questions here. The questions, the lex mechanic said. Hush now, Peter Kidden, De Mornay muttered before continuing. I can sense you are going to make this audience both brief and impolite, so I will speak plainly. Firstly, there are loyal subjects of the Emperor still on the planet below us, the planet you intend to incinerate. Mass evacuation is unfeasible, Azrael replied. The populace would need to be quarantined and screened en masse for warp taint. There is manifestly neither the time nor the facilities for such actions. While civilian losses are regrettable, de Mornay made a point of glancing at Asmudai. I was referring more to the burning of an entire great company of your fellow Adeptus Astartes. Firebombing Midgardia will not damage its underground habitats, Azrael said, and that was Grimnar's last recorded location. If by the Emperor will he yet lives, he will be unharmed, and when he emerges he'll be stranded in a toxic ash waste. If you have an alternative suggestion, Lord Inquisitor, by all means share it. I would have thought that as a member of his holy orders you would have rejoiced at the mass annihilation of mankind's darkest foes. Rest assured, nothing pleases me more, de Morny said. The less so if the victory comes at the price of one of the Imperium's greatest leaders. I never thought I would live to hear the Inquisition praising Logan Grimnar. Times can change, Azrael, as can the topic of conversation. What were you doing on Nurides? Azrael's jaw clenched. We were purging one of the Emperor's worlds of demonic infestation. And just how many demons did you banish there? Could the wolves leave any for you? An entire lion's blade strike force deployed to cleanse an infestation that had been wiped out days earlier. Is this a line of questioning or just an opportunity for gross insults? Your grudge bearing does you no credit, de Mornay. I don't need to humor you, not even for a moment. What were you looking for in the polar ruins, Azrael? What were your scouts guarding? That squad was inserted ahead of our main strike force. If you have any real questions, de Mornay, I suggest you start by asking the wolves how they died. That is what we first came here to redress. There is no evidence the wolves have attacked imperial citizens. Can the same be said of your chapter, Azrael? Their monsters butchered a squad of my tenth company, Azrael snapped. His reserve finally eroded. We have picked footage of it. Shame you don't also have footage of how the sole survivor of said butchering disappeared, de Mornay shot back and from within the depths of this very fortress monastery no less. Something here is not what it seems. The Inquisitor's gaze swung across the bridge, lingering on the communications pit where Mendaxus was bending low to reveal a spool of Dacia parchment. Choose your next words carefully, de Mornay. I smell the reek of the warp here, Azrael. Beside him, he felt Asmodai shudder at the Inquisitor's damning words. Azrael turned and stilled him with a gesture. This audience is over, he said. Get off my bridge. You don't end audiences with the Inquisition, Azrael, de Mornay said. And your bridge is as much a part of the Emperor's realm as anywhere else in the Imperium. There are no jurisdictions here, not for one bearing my seal. Azrael turned. It was not a sharp movement, neither sudden nor violent, but it was undoubtedly laden with threat. He took a single step forwards, so that even on his palanquin the aged Inquisitor was dwarfed by the angel's armoured form. 
the vast bridge went suddenly quiet. I grow tired of your games, Azrael said softly. Your prejudice against my chapter is well known. The mission that brings us here is not only entirely legitimate, it is desperately vital to the fate of the Imperium. We can do without your pathetic past grievances. I will make my own judgment on that matter, de Mornay said, putting his palanquin into grinding reverse. We shall speak again soon, no doubt, if we must. Azrael said grimly, Brother Sergeant Elijah will return you to your shuttle immediately. As the Inquisitor and his retinue retreated, the voice of Mendaxis clicked again in Azrael's ear. Sire, we are receiving fresh intelligence from Midgardia. There was a pause. Go on. It would appear that Logan Grimnar. Mendaxis hesitated again. What? Speak. Sire, Logan Grimnar is dead. Seven miles south of the Magma Gates, Midgardia. Midgardia's spores had eaten away the external picked recorders, so Eagle Ironwolf was blind to the firepower of his command tank as it rolled towards its objective. He could well imagine it, though. A stream of assault cannon rounds kicking up spooms of filth from the milky pus bog, bursting, shambling, slime stick plague bearers like overripe fruit. Swathes of bolt rounds sped from the glowing barrels of the Iron Fist hurricane bolters, smashing through spore trees, lancing plague beasts like boils, and cutting giant flies out of the air. The pitch and roll of the heavy transport added a tail of pulped and crushed weird scum, ground beneath Aquila's damped tracks. Eagle had witnessed similar sights many times down the centuries, and still it thrilled him. His brethren and the other great companies reveled in the sensation of the axe and chain blade chopping meat and bone, and the clash of steel on ceramite. Eagle had always considered his passion similar, but for him the glory of battle was not only in the muscle behind a blow, but also in the unbending metal that dealt it. Cog, track, bulkhead, and burning engine— In the armor of his great company, he saw the unstoppable strength and lightning speed of Russ himself. Wrath was so much more potent when it was clad in iron. Perhaps that was why he was pursuing his current course. Iron did not bend, and it did not break, except beneath the most terrible of forces. He would not acknowledge that these weirds born— These beasts bred from a madman's nightmares were stronger than he was. He wouldn't give them the privilege of forcing him to abandon his great wolf. He would not bend, and he would not break. Destination reached the Lord. Torvald's voice crackled over Iron Fist intercom. Ram's ready to drop on your mark. As soon as we're clear, rejoin the task force, Eagle said. He glanced back at Conran. Unlike the rest of the Iron Guard, he sat in one of the holds restraining harnesses, his expression stony. I will see you are aboard at the wolf tide, brother, Eagle said, with the great wolf. Conran added, nodding, May Ross and the All Father be with you. The time for words passed. Eagle's servo skull, Skull, hovered at his shoulder, its tiny anti gravitic motor buzzing. He checked his armor was properly sealed and banged the disembarkation. Rune above the land raider's forward hatch. It flashed from red to green. Wolf claws slid free, a thought sending energy crackling down the wicked blades. There was a thump of maglocks and a hiss of decompressed air. The ramp fell forwards and light, sickly and pale, flooded the troop compartment. Eagle charged out into the rot jungle a howl on his lips. Two seconds to assess his surroundings, Skull looked left, the skull's implanted vid-feed uploading directly to the Wolf Lord's bionic eye. Eagle went right, ten paces ahead, the corroded remains of the entrance to Midgardian mineshaft yawned. Iron Fist's hurricane bolter sponsons were still hammering. Only a handful of plague bearers were between the land raider and the mine entrance. One died with eagle's claws in its throat, gargling in its own icor. 
Moln Stormbrow, the first of Eagle's Iron Guard to follow the Wolf Lord from the hatch, pulverized another with a swing of his thunder hammer as it made a clumsy swipe for Skull. Into the mine, Eagle barked, bursting a squealing nurgling underfoot. Now, Olaf Ironhide, the final member of the Iron Guard, splashed out into the jungle's quagmire. Iron Fist's ramp immediately began to rise, and the tank was reversing before the opening was even sealed. Great tracks throwing up fountains of pestilent, sticky spume. The noble war machine was almost unrecognizable from the outside. Drenched in oozing filth, its thick armor plating pockmarked by ichor and spore clouds. The pain its machine spirit must have been suffering caused Eagle to bear his fangs beneath his visor as he gutted another droning plague bearer. With their lord at the center, the Iron Guard sprinted the last few yards to the mine's corroded metal overhang. Eagle's auto sensors stripped away the darkness within, picking out dead lumen globes and a rudimentary lift mechanism leading down into the mine proper. Its winch and cables, however, had long been eaten away. A servitor controller hardwired into the shaft's activation panel was little more than bones and rusted metal, its vat-grown flesh desiccated by Midgardia's spores. Borgen, hold them off, Eagle ordered. There must be a secondary point of access. Borgen Fire-Eye planted himself at the mine's entrance and unleashed his combi flamer on the demons gathering outside, spitting oaths and curses at the weird spawn even as he set their rotting flesh ablaze. The rest of the Iron Guard spread out around the lift chute, hunting for another path downwards. Eagle's visor display was already being lit by red flashing runes telling him the toxic air was eating away at his armor's sealant while Skull's gleaming cranium was becoming visibly more pitted and scarred with each passing second. They had to get below ground, and fast. Here, my Jarl, Bjorn Bloodfist said, a machine ladder running parallel to the lift. Eagle hurried to the Iron Guard's side and saw that he was right. A smaller shaft entrance, including a heavy ferroplast ladder designed for lowering mining machinery, led down into a darkness so deep even the scans of Eagle's augmented eye couldn't penetrate it. Will it hold? Orphan Highfell asked as they looked at the ladder, the doubt in his voice obvious. It will have to, Eagle said, turning to Moan. Collapse the entrance, he ordered. Jarl, do it. We need to descend, but it will take time. We cannot afford the pursuit. Moan hefted his hammer and replaced Borgen at the mine's entranceway. As Fire-Eye checked his weapon's Promethium level, Stormbrow swung his crackling weapon at one of the overhang support beams. The decaying timber gave with a splitting crash, and Moln ducked back just in time to avoid the thunderous fall of the mine's entrance. Eagle already had his feet on the machine ladder's rung clamps. The ferroplast groaned beneath his power-armored bulk, but held. He began to climb downwards, There was no time to think, no time to assess the situation, or calculate risk percentages. They had to get below before Midgardia's corrupt atmosphere poisoned them all. And besides, every second wasted was another second not knowing the fate of the Great Wolf. Mouthing a silent prayer to the Allfather, Eagle led his pack into the darkness of the Underworld, the rock in high orbit above Midgardia. For the most fleeting of moments, when the Inquisitor had first arrived on the bridge, the thing wearing the flesh of Vox Seneschal Mendaxis had known the closest sensation to fear, a creature such as it ever could. The unsettling sensation was soon replaced by the thrill of a close escape. For a second, as the human's eyes had fallen on it, the creature had fancied its flesh would unravel and its demon form would burst into holy flame. The Imperium storytellers would have enjoyed that. The purifying aura of his chosen servant burning away the disguises of the corrupt and scorching their evil plots from existence. The ridiculousness of it almost made the Mendaxus thing giggle out loud. The Inquisitor was just a man, and like all men, he had ultimately failed to see what was right in front of him. It was growing bored in the communication pit. It had been masquerading as the Vox Senecal since the Crusade fleet had entered the warp bound for Fenris. 
But now, with the Inquisitor's departure, Azrael had returned to his bauble throne above while the bridge busied itself with preparing solutions for Midgardia. Briefly, it had toyed with the idea of following the Inquisitor back to his shuttle and killing him and his simpering little herd of psychophants, a void pilot who accidentally opened both airlocks, perhaps, or a tragic carbon monoxide leak in the transport bay. But no, of the many, many skinds of fate that wove around such undeniably titillating acts, none of them furthered the task the Mendaxus thing was here to complete. It chided itself. There would be time aplenty for such games afterwards, once the wolf and the lion had torn each other's throats out. Finally, the balance of fate on the bridge changed. The one known as interrogator chaplain Elazar turned from the hollow chart he had been scanning and made for one of the bridge's vaulted exit gangways. Azrael was deep in conversation with the skull-helmed master interrogator chaplain, and no one else had the authority to stop the Voxena skull. The Mendaxus thing rose from the pit and followed lightly in Elazar's wake. As it went, it wondered whether any of the laboring menials around it would note that, although it appeared to walk, the body of Mendaxus was in fact floating a fraction of an inch above the bridge's worn flagstones. Such little touches amused it still further. There really was no cure for mankind's blindness. Elazar passed through the hissing blast doors and left the bridge. The Mendaxus thing slipped after him just before the door slid shut. Ahead, so real that it seemed to impose itself upon the Mendaxus thing's vision, fate's weave spread, a beautiful multi-hued tapestry spun by its master, and all the threads that were tied to Elazar's magboots led him to his private reclusium cell. That much was now inevitable, and the Mendaxus thing felt the gratification of knowing it had locked them both in the correct path. All that remained to do was pick which body it would greet the young interrogator chaplain with. The warp. They would have made him their master. Beast Lord. Wolfheart. The Wild King. They would have crowned him with savagery and robed him with hunger. He refused. He was not like them. Not yet. The truth pained him. He could not deny it. There was something, something inside all of them that refused to ever be tamed. All the hearth fires burned low, it would rather be hunting in the snow. While weapons lay at rest, it would rather sink fang and claw deep into prey flesh. Even some of those he had known the longest had succumbed to it. Scarpelt and Harrock, Hagmund and Ulfar. Long fangs and grey pelts all, given over to the beast within. They said the same thing, each one of them. The wolf time was coming. Leadership was needed. Would he join them? That was not his way. He reminded himself over and over. There was savagery, yes, but it was cold, calculated, unleashed only when the moment was right. The savagery the others now possessed burned bright, was blind to reason. It was the hungry rage that flung the wolf into the huntsman's trap. They were late. The warp was playing its usual tricks, seeking to confound and infuriate them. Fury made the beast stronger. He made more of his warriors turn. They had been bound for the Fenris system for what felt like a lifetime. The other great companies were already there, already fighting, already dying, already writing their sagas on Midgardia, Svelgard, and Frostheim. The thought pushed him even closer to the edge. He took a long, shuddering breath, trying to clear his head. Soon they would be home. Whether it would be as beasts or as men, he did not know. There was only one certainty. He would make all those who defiled Fenris pay.